Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us on the program. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Chad's warrior president, Idris Deby, has been laid to rest following a funeral attended by African leaders and the French president, Emmanuel Macron, keeping his promise of attending the event. President Macron has also declared his support for the Transitional Military Council in Chad, which is led by Deby's son, Mohamed Deby Ibno, a 37-year-old who previously served as the second in command of the military for the Chadian intervention in northern Mali. The military is still fighting insurgency, especially the Boko Haram and the Front for Change and Concord, which launched an offensive in Tibesti region in the north of the country following the Chadian presidential election, which ended up killing President Deby. President Deby was known to join his soldiers at the forefront in the fight, and he did it one last time before he sustained wounds from which he died later. We'll be delving into the impact of this on Chad and West Africa, which, as you know, has been battling insurgency for more than 10 years. It's a problem intertwined with political, economic, social, and, of course, security concerns. My guest is Dr. Ndu Mokolo, a partner and chief executive of Next Year Security, Peace, and Development. I'll be talking to him later about the impact of President Debbie's exit and other issues. And that's Diplomatic Channel in a wrap. Let's check in on those diplomatic headlines, and we'll be right back. The Minister of Foreign Affairs says he was shocked by the demise of Chadian President Idris Deby Itno from injuries suffered in frontline battle with rebels on April 20, 2021. A statement from the Minister of Foreign Affairs says Nigeria is greatly concerned about developments in Chad and calls on the interim leadership and all stakeholders at home and abroad, including the two armed groups still fighting, to not allow the evolving developments feed into more chaos with its attendant consequences. Nigeria, the ministry says, is willing to guide and mainstream within the framework of the Economic Community of Central African States and the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS. It says an early return to democratic governance in Chad should be the ultimate goal. The Minister of Interior, Mr. Rauf Arabashola, has promised 72-hour passport application and issuance for Nigerians as the ministry is committed to clearing the backlog of passport applications and issuance by May 31st this year at the latest. He stressed that the Nigerian passport is the strongest instrument of sovereignty, nationality and citizenship. He made the promise during a visit by the chairman, Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Abike Dabiri Erewa, at his office in Abuja. Mr. Reboshola says whoever holds a Nigerian passport is a bona fide citizen who must be treated with dignity and respect. Welcome back. As we said earlier, Chadian President Idris Deby was at the forefront of fighting insurgents in his country when he was wounded and later died. His army has been fighting rebels known as Front for Change and Concord in Chad, fact for short. A rebel group from Libya that crossed over into northern Chad on April 11th. At today, presidential elections held in Chad, but boycotted by main opposition parties. They attacked a border post before advancing south. President Idris Deby was set to become Chad's president a sixth time by the time polls were being counted after the April 11 presidential election. The election commission had put up until April the 25th to announce provisional results, but it was already clear that one of Africa's longest serving leaders and allies of Western powers in the fight against Islamist militants in West and Central Africa was not going anywhere. A week later, the country's army was stepping off a rebel convoy in the north of Kanem province. Local television showed soldiers celebrating their victory, destroyed vehicles in the desert, and a large group of prisoners sitting on the ground. They said at least 300 rebels were killed in the fighting and some 150 captured. The rebel group was known as the Front for Change and Concord in Chad, fact based on Chad's northern frontier in Libya. It claimed it had liberated the province of Kanem, some 220 kilometers from the capital in Jemena, but the government denied the claims. 
By Monday, April the 19th, provincial election results showed Idris Deby had won a sixth term. The planned celebration and Deby's victory speech in the capital had to be delayed because he wanted first to check in on soldiers on the front lines. The warrior president who had come to power in 1990 and faced repeated insurgencies in the desert north and mounting public discontent over his management of oil wealth and crackdowns on opponents never made it back. By Tuesday, April the 20th, the military announced that the 68-year-old died from wounds received on the front line. Un appel au dialogue et à la paix est lancé. Président, le général de corps d'armée, Mamad Idris Deby. His son, Mohamed Deby Into, was named interim head of state, and a transitional military council was formed with 15 members and Mohamed, who is in the army, as the council's leader. The army says it wants to return power to a civilian government and hold free democratic elections in 18 months. Vice President of the Transitional Military Council, Jimadum Tirena, released a statement saying that by putting in place a transitional military council, the defense and security forces are not seeking to seize power. And he reassured the people that the members of a transitional military council will return power back to the civilian government through free and democratic elections within 18 months. Facts rejected the arrangement, especially of Muhammad's leadership. They released a statement saying, In everything that concerns the life of the nation, we must not leave anything undecided. We therefore have a duty to present to you the reality as it is in our country at this moment. It's important that things are clear for all of us. Chad is not a monarchy. There can be no dynastic devolution of power in our country. The National Resistance Forces from the Front for Change and Concord are right now on their way towards N'Djamena, with confidence, but above all with courage and determination. They later announced they were advancing towards the capital. Though people were shocked by the turn of events, on the streets people are alarmed at the prospect that fighting could break out. Some said President Deby had done what was needed for the country, and they preferred that the transitional government be a neutral person who is not in the military, a civilian. As concerns continue to rise over the country's security situation, French President Emmanuel Macron mourned a dear friend and even showed up for the funeral. Alongside other African leaders, France defended the military takeover despite objections even from the opposition. Under the Constitution, the Speaker of the National Assembly should have become interim president. But after the military had already shut down Parliament, Speaker Haroun Kabadi said giving the military security and political context, he had agreed to a military transition but full lucidity. Let's talk to partner and chief executive of next year Security, Peace and Development, Dr. Ndu Mokolo. He joins us from Abuja studio. Dr. Mokolo, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. I want to begin uh, with the rebel group that's fighting in Chad's north currently. They're called the Front for Change and Concord in Chad. Fact for short. Who are they and what do they want? Well, FACT was formed in 2016 um, by a young uh, patronage of uh, uh, Mahad Nora. Incidentally, there, there's a bit of confusion between um, FAT and Union of Forces for, Development, for Democracy and Development, which is actually where FAT pulled out from in 2016 to form their own. Just like other groups, uh, other rebel groups in, in, in Chad, they are all fighting for one thing, to topple the, the reign of um, late President Idris um, Deby, which um, of course we know what happened last week with his death and then his son being swelling as a, the, uh, the, uh, the head of state of, of Chad. Now, their leader is Mahamat Nouri. He's exiled in France, but he's said to have, to have fighters on the ground in Chad. How, how different is the group from other rebel groups in Western Central Africa? Well, um, for, for the one in Chad, everybody knows what they are fighting for. They are not a religious uh, ideological group or an Islamic militant group. 
all they are fighting for the most rebel groups in Chad, especially the ones, of, the ones led by Mohamed Nore and uh, Mohamed Ali, uh, Mahadi Ali, the, 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 lead, the actual leader of FAD. All they are fighting for is to get President uh, Debbie out of, uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, out of authority, which somehow they've succeeded, but they actually haven't succeeded because his son has taken over. So they are different from um, other groups like ISWAP, like other groups fighting in Central Africa or Northern Africa that are linked to Islamic militarism. If, if, you, if you can see that the last election that was held in 11th of April, all the major political parties in Chad are uh, absented They're from it, and, and President Dabi just went on to win. So this is what they are fighting for, to make sure there is inclusion in Chad. They have rejected the Transitional Military Council, the one headed by um, the uh, Chadian president's son, uh, uh, Bahamat Idris Debi. Um, they did release a statement expressing their disagreement over the TMC. Now, why would they feel that they have a stake in governance at all? Um, first, Chad, like most um, sub-Saharan African, African country, is made of is multi multi-ethnic, multi-religion, and um, multicultural. So for one family or one people to hold on to power for over 30 years, excluding other, other, uh, other segments of the country, um, is not something I, I think uh, people are ready to have. I think this is what led to, to what we saw last week. Now remember that uh, this is not the first time an attempted coup has been tried against uh, late President Dabi. There was one that was uh, that happened in 2006, then 2008, and the one that happened in 2019. So it has always been a continuous trial to get him out of power, you know. Now, I remember President uh, um, uh, Idris Dabi would always go to an election and win. Uh, we all know how he wins. Um, he's a, um, a militant Democrat, which everybody knows. It does not mean that he does not win the election, but the but the style of winning the election is what a lot of Chadians do not agree with him. The question now is what sort of leader he will make. His father imposed, you know, was this, you know, he imposed this, this warrior-like president, you know, on, on everyone. And he, he seems to have garnered, you know, the respect of neighboring leaders, leaders of neighboring countries as well as France. You think that uh, Mahamat, his son, who's in the military, following after his father's footsteps, can also make that sort of leader? Well, only time will tell. But if you look at some of the pictures trending on the internet on uh, how the president died, it's important for us to understand that it, it seems like an inside job. You know, from, from literature and from what an, an, some, a lot of analysts have been seeing, it shows that even within his own ethnic group, they are, you know, leaving, uh, you know, them and joining other ethnic groups to fight against um, the rule of, 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 of the Idris uh, Debi family. So, um, for countries like France that supported uh, President Idris, they didn't do that because they think that his democratic uh, credentials were okay. They did that because of the strategic support he gave to the fight against um, um, Islamic militarism. So that's why they supported him. So for them to support the son means that he, if he's likely to toe the tone of his father and continue to support the war against um, uh, Islamic militants, he's likely to drop some sympathy from France and from other Western allies who had supported the dad. But the, it now remains that if you look at the way things are working, um, these Western countries have not really equally come out to oppose the rebel, uh, the rebel forces. Strategically, they, they try to allow it to unfold. But one thing they didn't want to do is to allow what, you know, their involvement in, the, in, in toppling President uh, Gaddafi in Libya to happen. So they saw Idris Debi as, some, as a wage, as somebody they can rely on in fighting Islamic militarism. But that does not mean that they are, they are going to fight against um, the other rebel forces who are at, uh, actually fighting for, fighting for inclusion.
trying to make sure that, you know, that democratic norms and principles are installed in, in, in Chad. Our conversation with Dr. Undu Wokolo continues in a moment after the break. Join us again. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, released a statement saying that um, calling on all parties in, in Chad to focus on stabilizing the country and that Nigeria will work with uh, the Economic Community of uh, Central African States and the ECOWAS, you know, in helping Chad to stabilize. Nigeria is already facing a ton of pressure from insurgents, not just the Boko Haram now. You also have the herdsman crisis. Now you have gunmen, you know, raiding um, the southeastern part of the country. How much support can Nigeria provide Chad at this time? Um, it's very dicey, very, very dicey because already records show that we have, we have our military operating almost in the in 36 states of the Federation. So um, looking at the number of our soldiers and the, and, uh, and the wars they are fighting in almost all fronts of the country, it is very difficult to say the least. It is very difficult in the sense that we don't even have enough police to do the uh, you know, internal policing. So talk less of our sending our soldiers to, to help our child. We are even relying on Chad to help us do a lot of our, to fight the insurgents in, in, in the Northeast. My thinking is that everybody is talking about stabilizing Chad, but nobody is talking about issues of democratization, which has led to what we're seeing. It has to do with governance. For you to be able to deal with this is to start pushing for a government of national unity, where a government that is inclusive, where you try to talk to all the rebel groups, whom incidentally we all know what they want. What do they want? Be included in scheme of things. You know, as, as you speak, I do remember a paper that you wrote um, on the Sahel, and you draw. It was a background report, a background paper about um, you know the the peace in the Sahel. I'm trying to remember the topic now, but I do remember what I got from it, which is where you draw the comparison between, or rather, the relationship between uh, governance and you know the rise of these rebels. But if you're talking about West Africa. Um, Politics has been quite stable. I mean, elections hold when they're supposed to hold. Haven't really had any leaders who have stayed beyond you know, their time. So how does that then justify the rise of uh, rebels and insurgent groups within West Africa and you know, the chaos that they're unleashing on the region? Now, what we're seeing is that we have a lot of militant Democrats among some of these West African states, especially where some of them were ex-military leaders who transformed to Democrats, uh, happened to win the election. They continue to stay in power over years. Um, there are so many of them. Even uh, without looking at West Africa, you can look at Uganda, you can look at um, Rwanda. Then the, the issue we're discussing, Chad, these are places where someone was a former military leader, um, tried to transform to a democratic leader with military tendencies and all that. They don't want to leave power and they will continue to stay, want to stay. Um, for instance, we know what is happening in Cameroon. So these are leaders who are ex, either they, want, either they came to power through a military coup and trying to win an election, and then they, they continue to use those, the, those anti-democratic processes that seems like um, as if they are democratic and perpetuate themselves in power over years. It was the same uh, in Gambia until, why Gambia was easier was because um, the opposition parties didn't take uh, an a, a violent insurgent approach. What they did was to come together and they were able to, to push the president out of power. So if that had happened in, in, in Chad, it would have been easier. But now, with the death of Idris uh, Dabi, it's going to be a bit difficult because each rebel group will want to hold the territory where they are in control of. 
So just finally, um, how then do you now deal using a holistic approach with the insurgency in Nigeria and the rise of armed groups that are threatening the peace? I, I want to be very, very straightforward here about what is happening in Nigeria. I think the, the, the insurgency in Nigeria is easy to deal with. I will give you an instance, like the one in the southeast, the one in the southwest, the one in north. In, apart from where there is an ideological position, a religious ideological position that changes where someone is trying to overthrow the state. That is an issue. But where you have an, a position of interest where a group of people are saying, no, we want to be included in, in, in the scheme of things. We are fighting because, because of exclusion, then it's easier to deal with. I think in the case of Nigeria, if, this, if the Nigerian state communicates very well, communication in, in, the, in the sense of bringing those who, who have um, other belief which they think that the state hasn't done well for them, bring them together and actually know what the problem is. It's easier to deal with. With what is happening now, the Nigerian state cannot continue to fight in all fronts. Because most of the things, most of these rebel or, or, or insurgent groups are saying are easier to deal with. It's difficult from where someone is actually trying to overthrow the state. In the case of Libya, in the case of Chad, you find out that FAT as a group had one thing in mind to overthrow the government of Idris Dhabi. Now that the son has taken over, they will continue to fight. But if he had died and there was a government of national unity bringing them all together, it would have been easier. Flip it to Nigeria. Most of the groups who are fighting in Nigeria, apart from the issues, those in the banditry and the terrorist group, whom I think there's equally a way to deal with them. If someone's position is known, you, it's easier to speak to the person. If we take the, the, the group in, in the Southeast, part of what the group is asking is no issues of non-inclusion. The same thing with the group in the South South, the same thing with the group in the Southwest. If there's a way that these groups are brought together to talk with the government, to ne negotiate with government, Negotiation here doesn't mean giving away the powers of the state, but to actually know what they, what they want and how you can deal with them. I think you, you are halfway solving the problem. Dr. Ndewokolo, thank you again for speaking with us on Diplomatic Channel. Thank you. U.S. President Joe Biden made leaders very happy last week when he announced that after years of environmental policy rollbacks, America is recommitted to global efforts to address climate change and cut U.S. greenhouse gas pollution in half from 2005 levels by 2030. There was more good news when he said America looks forward to working with Russia on carbon removal efforts as happened during the climate summit. Please welcome, Please welcome the President. The U.S. President made the comments about the removal of carbon dioxide following a call by the Russian President Vladimir Putin and said he looked forward to working with By Russia. President Biden said this after promising to cut U.S. greenhouse gases in half by the end of the decade. The United States sets out on the road to cut greenhouse gases in half, in half by the end of this decade. That's where we're headed as a nation. And that's what we can do if we take action to build an economy that's not only more prosperous, but healthier, fairer, and cleaner for the entire planet. You know, these steps will set America on a path of net zero emissions economy by no later than 2050. Important virtual also making promises was Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who pledged to reduce his country's carbon footprint by 2050. This is a commitment we in Israel fully share. I pledge to reduce Israel's carbon footprint and to completing a successful transition from fossil fuels 
to renewable energy by 2050. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says his country will aim to cut its emission of greenhouse gases by 40 to 45 percent from 2005 levels by 2030, up from the current target of 30 percent. Our new climate target for 2030 is to reduce our 2005 emission levels by 40 to 45 percent. And we will continually strengthen our plan and take even more actions on our journey to net zero by 2050. The Chinese President Xi Jinping on his part called for unprecedented ambition and action to build a community life for man and nature. He says countries must be committed to harmony between man and nature, green development, systematic governance and a people-centered approach. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa called on developing countries to meet their climate responsibilities to developing economies. It is important that aid on climate change should be provided separately and should not be part of conventional development assistance. Finally, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for global efforts to defeat climate change, warning world leaders that the planet was at the verge of the abyss. We need a green planet. But the world is on red alert. The Global Climate Summit, called by the U.S. President, held virtually, was attended by 40 world leaders to underscore the urgency and the economic benefits of stronger climate action. This is where we end the program this week. And don't forget, more Diplomatic Channel episodes can be found on the Channel's TV website. Just go to Programs and click on Diplomatic Channel. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'll see you next time.